Typically, you quarantine the sick. When someone has measles, you quarantine them. We've never seen where we quarantine the healthy. Actually, we have. The word quarantine itself comes from the practice of locking down healthy people for forty days. Quarantena in old Italian when ships arrived in Venice from areas of plague. In the seventeenth century, the villagers of Iam in England, most of them healthy, locked themselves down when a few of their number caught bubonic plague. If you don't recognise this guy, he's Dan Erickson, one of two doctors who held a press conference back in April. They work for Accelerated Urgent Care in Bakersfield, California. They specialise in common ailments like these, and the reason for the press conference was to voice concern that their business was suffering because of COVID-19 restrictions. This has caused some severe disruption for Accelerated, as we have people coming in seven in the morning till midnight. We're reporting to the health department. We're calling patients back. And at the same time, our volumes have dropped significantly. Now, I'm not unsympathetic to opinions that lockdowns may be doing more harm than good. After all, these doctors, like so many people running a business, have seen a sharp decline in income because of lockdowns. They also have an adverse effect on mental health. They increase domestic violence, economic hardship, infringe on civil liberty, raise unemployment, and lower GDP. So I don't mind listening to arguments for and against, but I do mind when people try to support their case by misrepresenting scientific facts and figures, and presenting bogus information, and that's what's happening here. They claimed that lockdown isn't necessary because they calculated wrongly, as it turns out, that the infection fatality rate of COVID-19 is only 0.03 percent, a third that of flu. That claim, of course, went viral. So let's go through their calculation and just buzz in when you spot the mistake. So if we look at California, these numbers are from yesterday. We have 33,865 COVID cases. Out of a total of 280,900 total tested, that's 12% of Californians were positive for COVID. Good use of the buzzer, and you're right. It's not 12% of Californians who were COVID positive. It's 12% of the people who got tested, and they obviously aren't representative of the population as a whole. Because before mass testing came in, people got tested because they had symptoms, or were exposed to the virus, or thought they might have been exposed to the virus. So there's going to be a much higher percentage of positive cases among those tested during the early weeks of the pandemic, compared to the general population. It's like doing a survey of a waiting room at a Texas hospital and discovering that a third of the people waiting are critically ill. You can't scale that up and assume that therefore a third of Texans must be critically ill. So the more you test, the more positives you get. But that's a classic case of mixing up measurements. You get more positive cases, but the percentage of positive cases, which is what the doctors are measuring for their calculation, doesn't go up. It goes down. Even if the doctors don't understand the difference between a number and a percentage, which I find hard to believe. All they have to do is look at the data they claim to be using. As testing expanded to the California population as a whole, shown by the light brown bars on this graph, the number of positive cases went up, shown by the darker brown at the bottom. But the percentage of positive cases went down, shown by the blue line with the percentage scale on the right-hand side. A month after the doctors held their press conference, far more people were being tested. And of course, the positivity rate was down from 12% to around 4.5%. The doctor's analysis was so bad and so amateurish that the American College of Emergency Physicians and the American Academy of Emergency Medicine took the extraordinary step of issuing a joint statement disowning it. They called the doctor's claims reckless and untested musings. I got interested in this topic when someone posted this on the forum, and it seems to be a view that's widely shared. Listening to the science didn't work out so well. Seven months later, and a global recession. Even Fauci now says, on a recent 60 Minutes, he would not shut down the economy when faced with a similar virus. Actually, that's not what Fauci said. But I'm more interested in the idea that listening to the science isn't a good idea.
because science can't tell you whether lockdowns are the right policy. That's a personal opinion and ultimately a political decision. All it can tell you is what the epidemiological effects of a lockdown will be, the reproduction rate of the virus, the number of infections, and roughly how many people would die over what period of time. That's why listening to the science always works out well, because it ensures that when a government weighs the pros and cons of lockdown, it does so on the basis of facts and figures, rather than ideological dogma, blind guesses and wishful thinking. So what do real scientific studies say about lockdowns? Lockdown has become a catch-all word to describe restricted movements, limits on social gatherings and the closure of certain businesses. Sometimes the rules are tightened, sometimes they're relaxed, depending on whether the number of cases is rising or falling. Scientific studies refer to these as restrictions or non-pharmaceutical interventions. What about Sweden? Sweden, 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 Sweden. Hold on, I'm going to look at Sweden in a minute. A lot of posters on my channel suggested I take a look at the claims of Ivor Cummins, an Irish biochemical engineer who runs a YouTube channel. Unlike the Bakersfield doctors, he actually cites scientific studies, which is commendable. We now have many, many publications, including Lancet, that show clearly, based on the data, that lockdown barely or does not affect deaths per million outcomes. Well, here's the first one on the list, and the one Cummins highlights. It wasn't published in The Lancet, which is one of the world's top two medical journals. It was published in eClinical Medicine a separate open-access journal owned by The Lancet. Nevertheless, it concluded that lockdowns don't affect mortality rates, which is supportive of Cummins's claims. But here's the problem. When I look for other studies in Lancet-owned journals and in The Lancet itself, they all reached the opposite conclusion. They all concluded that lockdowns reduced rates of infection. Some showed that the stricter lockdown measures were, the more effective they were. And they showed that when the strictest lockdown measures were lifted, infection rates began to rise again. Picking one study from the Lancet group that supports your case and ignoring all the others that don't is called cherry-picking. And it's a familiar tactic on social media. So then I moved on to the second paper on Cummins' list, which was published by a very reputable journal, Science. It's a shame that Cummins doesn't show the paper and give a proper citation or link so that people can read it for themselves. I could only find the study by doing a search of Google Scholar using the part of the title that Cummins showed. It's a paper by Denning et al. But when I clicked on the link, it turns out that the title of the paper has changed. According to Cummins, the paper claimed lockdown had only a minor effect. In fact, their study, which looked at lockdowns in Germany, found a clear reduction of the spreading rate related to each governmental intervention. And it concluded, our results suggest that the full extent of government interventions was necessary to stop exponential growth. Then I checked the third citation in the list, which turns out to be ambiguous. There's no such thing as the Koch Institute. There's the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, a respected government medical agency that advises on responses to the pandemic. And there's the Charles Koch Institute in the United States, an American lobby group that gives frequent opinions and conclusions on the pandemic from a political perspective. If Cummins is citing the political lobby group, Charles Koch, then its opinions about the reproduction rate are irrelevant because it isn't a scientific body. If Cummins is citing the Scientific Institute, the Robert Koch Institute, it stated very clearly that lockdowns are effective. In this bulletin, the RKI says, Zum Beispiel führen Maßnahmen zur Isolation, oh sorry, isolation measures of confirmed cases and the quarantining of contact persons lead not only to a reduction in the number of secondary cases, but also to a shortening of the generation time. The RKI even did a review of studies that looked at the effect of restrictions and interventions. It listed the conclusions of each one. The vast majority found that restrictions slowed the reproduction rate of the virus or reduced the number of cases, or both. If you want to check them for yourselves, the review is linked in the video description. Based on this thorough review of the scientific literature, the RKI doesn't conclude that lockdowns are ineffective. It says the complete opposite. 
In our analysis, we find a strong dose-response effect of restrictions on gatherings, the requirement to wear masks, and the closings of workplaces and schools to growth of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not going to go through the list and track down every blog article and study. That's something Cummins should have done before he posted it. But at number 17, I did spot one that I'd already read in the British Medical Journal, so I knew that Cummins had misrepresented that one too. It's not a scientific study, it's a non-peer-reviewed news article looking at why Belarus had so few deaths due to COVID-19. The likely explanations, the article reports, are a high proportion of hospital beds per thousand population, 40 times that of the UK, and a structural bias towards dealing with pandemics, and mass testing, and very few care homes, and the relative isolation of the country that means borders could be easily closed and travellers monitored. And finally, because Belarus is a dictatorship, where the figures may have been fudged anyway. Some experts fear that many coronavirus-related deaths are registered as cases of pneumonia. Most importantly, even if it had been a scientific study, the article made no conclusion about the effectiveness of lockdown, and nothing in the article that suggests lockdowns are ineffective. So, just like numbers two and three, what on earth is it doing on Cummins's list? He needs to check all these supposed sources, read them properly, make sure they're peer-reviewed scientific studies and not newspaper stories or political blogs, pick out the ones that really do show that lockdowns are ineffective, and then repost an accurate list. If you don't cherry-pick and misread, what real scientific studies show is that lockdowns are effective. It doesn't mean they're a good idea. It just means that they are effective in reducing the spread of an infectious disease. That's been known since 14th century Venice, and it's pretty obvious why. So all other things being equal, the strictest lockdown measures, which most countries do when the R rate gets dangerously high, ought to result in a reduction of COVID-19 cases after about 10 to 14 days. And that's exactly what we see. What about Sweden? Sweden. 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 All right. So what about Sweden? Sweden never locked down, never mandated masks, never closed their borders, never closed their under-16 schools, never closed their restaurants and bars, and did everything they could to avoid trampling on human rights. Sweden took an approach based on science. Well, Tony Heller did get one thing right. Sweden took an approach based on science, just like most countries, with a couple of obvious exceptions. Swedish epidemiologists know as well as American or British epidemiologists that eliminating mass gatherings and restricting movement slow the spread of the virus, including the architect of the Swedish model, Anders Tegnell. He says people who claim Sweden didn't have restrictions are wrong. It, you're saying that the strategy here, apart from the face masks, is pretty much the same as everywhere else, is that? To, to a great extent, yes. I mean, we also slow down many things. Um, the uh, um, domestic airplane air flights in Sweden were slowed down to basically nothing. There was no domestic flights in Sweden anymore. Uh, this was due to people stopped traveling, not because we made it mandatory for the flights to stop. Trains were also cut down quite a lot. So the society really slowed down quite a lot also in Sweden. I think much more than many people in other countries uh, understand. The reason Tegnell thought a voluntary system would work is that Sweden has a number of advantages over countries outside of Scandinavia. For one thing, it has a modern universal healthcare system that the authorities calculated had enough ICU beds to cope with a high number of COVID cases and treat them effectively. Secondly, most Swedes live alone, and the country isn't a major tourist destination or a travel crossroads, so it would be less vulnerable to a rapid spread of the virus. Sweden isn't a particularly religious country, so you don't see many mass gatherings in churches or mosques. And most importantly, imposing rules is probably not even necessary. After all, this is the nation that gave us ABBA and Volvos, Swedes don't go around raping and pillaging anymore. They're a pretty sensible, responsible people who, for the most part, follow government advice. Isn't that a little racist? If I like their race, (laughs) how can that be racist? So the authorities opted for guidelines like these rather than legally enforced rules. Refrain from unnecessary journeys. Avoid public transport. Don't go to meetings and concerts. 
and so on. Life looks pretty good in Sweden. Things are open, their schools are open, their universities are open. People in Sweden are going about their lives normally. Well, not really. A photograph doesn't tell the whole story. Sweden may have a more relaxed approach than countries like Britain and France, but life in Sweden over the last 11 months has been anything but normal. As well as the voluntary guidelines, there are also restrictions mandated by law. Crowd sizes at public events were limited to 50 people, and as the virus got worse, that number was reduced to just eight. Restaurants and bars can only serve customers who are seated. Visits to nursing homes are restricted. There are travel restrictions from other countries. Twice, schools have switched to remote learning. And that's in addition to all the voluntary guidelines I just showed you regarding gatherings, social distancing and staying home. A survey by Sweden's Civil Contingencies Agency suggests that 87% of the population are continuing to follow social distancing recommendations and domestic airlines are grounded. And according to Anders Tegnell, Swedes have only around 30% of the social interactions that they did prior to the pandemic. Uh, Sweden travel a lot less than they usually do. They actually decrease their travel more than the travel was decreased in our uh, Scandinavian neighbours. Uh, if you ask Swedes, 80-90% of them say that their, their lives have been very much affected by the COVID-19. So I think you, you make a mistake if you think that the Swedish lockdown was less in place and was less effective than in many other places just because it was a voluntary lockdown. So admire the Swedish model by all means, but let's not pretend that life in Sweden has gone on as normal. This is all far from normal. Sweden has reached herd immunity even as the United States panics. But Sweden is nowhere near reaching herd immunity. That's the problem with believing tabloid newspapers like the Daily Mail, instead of listening to epidemiologists and checking the figures. Back in May, Professor Bjorn Olsen said herd immunity in Sweden is a long way off, if we ever reach it. And in August, he co-authored a study showing rates of infection way below the 60 to 70 percent needed for herd immunity, as did a study commissioned by the Swedish Public Health Agency in May, and a third study in December. And even the man every proponent of the Swedish model likes to quote, Anders Tegnell, said as late as November that the issue of herd immunity is difficult and there are no signs of immunity in the population that are slowing down the infection. In this graph, you can see the difference between what's going on in Sweden with Dr. Anders Tegnell versus the U.S. with Dr. Fauci. But of course the United States is doing even worse than Sweden. Anders Tegnell was put in charge of Sweden's pandemic policy, while Anthony Fauci had no executive power at all. He could only advise a president who routinely ignored his advice. So while Sweden had a national plan led by an epidemiologist, the United States had none, led by a politician. And there are other differences. Sweden had a universal health care system which could cope with a pandemic and where everyone could get treated free of charge. Whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's something the United States doesn't have. And unlike Sweden, where few people go to church, millions of Americans continued to pack places of worship. And Swedes are pretty healthy. Compare the level of diabetes in Sweden with that of the United States. This is the level of obesity in Sweden compared to the USA. And while most domestic flights in Sweden were grounded, in the United States they continued flying. And most Swedes followed government guidelines and restrictions. In the United States, these varied from state to state and were often ignored, even by the leader of the country, and even by politicians urging others to follow the guidelines. So why would anyone be surprised that the American death toll was higher? To see how Sweden's been doing... It's no good comparing it to countries with completely different population densities, different obesity levels, different healthcare systems and different cultures. You need to compare it with countries where all those things are similar. And that's not hard. Sweden's neighbours have very similar profiles in all those respects. The only significant differences were mandatory lockdowns versus voluntary lockdown and policies on mask wearing, test and trace. The result? At the time of writing, Sweden has a mortality rate, in other words the number of deaths per million people, four times that of Denmark, 
eight times that of Finland and ten times that of Norway. And now even mainstream media outlets like Newsweek are acknowledging the fact that they succeeded. Well, that may be Newsweek's opinion, but opinion is not fact. If the United States had the same mortality rate as Sweden, then instead of having 260,000 deaths at the time of writing, it would have had 210,000 deaths. People can have their own opinions about whether that's a success, but they aren't entitled to change the facts to fit that opinion. So what's my opinion? Well, of course, the whole point of this channel is not to tell you what I think, but to fact-check the claims of those who do give you their opinion and to present facts so you can form your own opinion. You just can't borrow someone else's opinion off the shelf or beat the drum for a team. You have to answer questions that are rather difficult to answer. For example, apart from the fatalities caused by COVID-19, how do we assess the downside of millions of people who didn't die but continue to feel the effects? I also wanted to mention that 96% of people in California who get COVID recover with almost no significant sequelae or no significant uh, continuing medical problems. But where does that figure come from? That's the trouble with doing science by press conference. There's a tendency to dream up some figures on the back of an envelope and throw others out with a confident knowledge they can't be checked. Ericsson is saying that only about 4% of people suffer long-term effects from COVID-19. It's impossible to say if Ericsson got that figure from a reliable source or made a mistake or found it in a blog or simply made it up. All I can do is cite proper studies and real figures which do have sources you can check. For example, a British study found that 10% of people experience prolonged illness after COVID-19 a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that 71% of COVID cases in Italy had symptoms during infection, and of those, 32% still had one or two symptoms two months later, and 44% had a worse quality of life. Another US study found that only 35% of people didn't return to their previous level of health two to three weeks after a positive test. It's known as long covid the long-term health problems brought on by COVID-19. Symptoms range from fatigue and joint pain to chest pain and diarrhoea, and more seriously, heart problems and breathing difficulties. I sympathise with people like the Bakersfield doctors whose businesses are suffering, but giving misinformation like that isn't helping. If we, as Tony Abbott suggested, let nature run its course and take no action to curb the virus, would these doctors be back in business, or would patients be even less likely to visit their hospital? Would it make businesses like cafes, bars and movie theatres more popular, or would people be worried about an uncontrolled pandemic and stay away? In other words, would keeping everything open and letting the pandemic run its course result in better economic conditions or worse? And what about the people who work in these places and interact with a heavily infected public? Is it fair to ask them to risk their lives? And if they refuse, would it be fair to sack them? And if people were free to contract COVID, which is surely their right, is that fair on people they might infect, or on hospital staff who would then have to risk their lives treating these people? And how do we factor in the cost of lockdown in terms of mental health, educational setback, how do you assess that level of pain felt by millions of people under lockdown and then compare it to, say, the pain of losing a loved one or the suffering caused by long COVID? I know that borrowing an opinion off the shelf is very simple, quick and easy. And thinking about questions like these, weighing them in the balance and checking all the facts and figures is much harder work. But if you're going to voice an opinion and hold that opinion very firmly – then I hope you have weighed each of these questions carefully and are very sure of your answers.